I think all the changes that were made were on the on the on the other one. Let me pull up a different slide set. I think that will have. So let me show you this particular case. So we'll switch back and forth between this. So having a pre-ablation CT scan <coughs> would be helpful to uh, appropriately size the catheter for you. Uh, measuring the uh, osteal diameters of, the, of all the veins um, can help you to appropriately size your balloon. If, if somebody has really small pulmonary veins, then I think going with a 23 makes sense. If somebody has larger veins, then picking up a 28 millimeter catheter makes sense um, uh, in, those, in those patients. So check for PV potentials. Uh, this is an example of the left superior pulmonary vein uh, before ablation. There is CS spacing going on, and then you clearly see uh, the presence of the double potentials on the uh, achieved catheter. And then uh, this is the LIPV. Before the ablation, you come across all the potentials. So this is the case where you're trying to get the LSPV um, from the tip of the ablation of the cryo balloon catheter. You can actually inject contrast into it and then be able to visualize if you're able to accomplish uh, good occlusion of the uh, vein or not. I mean, this is, a, this is a pretty decent occlusion here. I mean, once in a while, you see a little bit of a leak from the superior aspects of that left superior pulmonary vein. Uh, but again, this is as good as it, it gets. Early on, it is always very unnerving to take this humongous balloon and then try to push it ac across against the atrial tissue, in the process of getting that occlusion. Um, uh, but but you have to really apply some decent amount of force to really get that occlusion. Uh, since this is a, a, the, it's a, it's a pretty soft, smooth balloon, the risk of perforation is pretty low on this. I think uh, getting that appropriate amount of force and the contact with the atrial tissue makes all the difference in terms of your ability to successfully derival a lesion and uh, minimize the number of re -up secondary applications that you would need for each of these veins. So, this is the left superior pulmonary vein um, post ablation. Uh, as you see it here, the double potential that was seen earlier is actually gone. And this is the, the concept of differential pacing to, uh, to basically confirm the presence of the far field potential from the left atrial appendage that you've been seeing in the left superior pulmonary vein. Uh, again, this is the LIPV, uh, picture of which we've shown uh, post ablation. You don't really see uh, much of any atrial signal there. Uh, there is some dissociated filing here with a little bit of uh, ectopic activity inside the left inferior pulmonary vein post ablation. And uh, this, is, this is a good example of LIPV post ablation where you have uh, pacing going on from the coronary sinus, demonstrating the entrance block, and then there is exit block with none of these um, ectopic beats that are generated inside the left inferior pulmonary vein uh, are able to make it out into the left atrium, a good confirmation of an isolated left inferior pulmonary vein. So this is the right inferior pulmonary vein uh, before isolation. And you definitely see double potential in, in there. And uh, this is where we actually had the RIPV occlusion. Uh, what you see there is a slow intermittent um, stimulation uh, of the diaphragmatic nerve uh, with a catheter that's placed at the SVC. Um, so this is one area that is very important when you're ablating the right-sided veins, more so with the right superior pulmonary vein than the right inferior. Uh, you would want to pace the diaphragm, um, the phrenic nerve, to be able to appreciate the, the excursion of the diaphragm in such a way. I mean, you don't really have to pace it uh, very fast. It can be pretty slow. And uh, when you come on the, the cryo application, and the moment you see the diaphragmatic excursion slowing down, you really want to thaw out and po change the position of your uh, ablation catheter, and then you should be able to um, uh, reapply and be able to isolate the vein. So this is the right superior pulmonary vein. Again, there is a contrast going through. You don't really see much of any leak around it. Uh, again, a sign of a good occlusion. And this was a, a case where a diaphragmatic paralysis actually happened and uh, where 
you are able to see the paradoxical motion of the diaphragm with the how it, it actually moves across against the rest of the uh, chest cavity there. So that can potentially happen in these cases if uh, proper attention is not paid to uh, and then if you don't make an attempt to really stimulate the phrenic nerve on the, on the right side when you are ablating the uh, right superior pulmonary vein. This is the RIPV post, you pretty much see not much of any electrical activity there. This is RSPV post with both the entrance and exit blocks demonstrated. So most of these cases um, as um, uh, everybody has started adapting using adenosine as uh, one of the confirmatory tests to demonstrate the dormant uh, conduction, uh, we also do that on a pretty routine basis. Um, I would like to show you some additional stuff here since my jump drive arrived. I wanted to share a few of the, um, the independent European studies that were, that were done. So this is, a, this is a series of three different studies that were done. Uh, showing the role of uh, arctic front balloon uh, in, in relatively smaller number of patients. Um, they were able to get anywhere between 72 to 77 percent depending on, um, uh, depending on uh, the, the, the patient substrates they looked at. Um, that's a pretty decent number. And uh, the number of complications were pretty similar to what we have seen in the STOP AF trial. The, the biggest problem that I have noticed is the higher incidence of phrenic nerve paralysis uh, they have not really seen much of any pulmonary vein stenosis. That is actually one of the biggest advantages that are touted by this particular energy form. And, uh, and the risk of perforations, I think, that is, that is still there. We have a pretty big sheath and, uh, I mean, a big hardware that you have to manipulate. But again, if, if done properly and taking all the necessary precautions, as uh, Dr. Balbir Singh uh, talks to you about how whenever you advance a catheter through a transeptal sheath, you always have to proceed it with a wire or a soft-tipped catheter in order to be able to minimize the, the, the trauma from the uh, tip of the transeptal sheath. Um, a recent meta-analysis um, actually looks at, dissects the data pretty nicely. Um, there is really not much of a difference between the cryo-balloon ablation as well as the uh, RF ablation techniques. The 12 month freedom was about 73%, uh, which is still a pretty decent number. The incidence of phrenic paralysis was about 6.38%, and pulmonary vein stenosis in this particular meta analysis was seen uh, in about 1%, close to 1%, and a pretty small risk of stroke and so forth. Um, what I was actually uh, impressed at is the uh, um, uh, the esophageal ulcerations and the number of pericardial effusions and tamponades uh, that they have come across. The STOP AF trial um, that was presented a couple of years ago, um, drug versus cryoablation, the baseline characteristics are not really much different between these two people. The acute outcomes and the effectiveness results are definitely in favor of the uh, cryoballoon. So, uh, a good pulmonary vein isolation technique, either you use cryo or RF, uh, again, compared against a drug is uh, definitely superior. So their uh, 12 months outcomes were about 70% success rate um, compared to a pretty paltry 7% for the drug. Uh, operator experience and learning curve plays a big role here. So obviously the, the, the treatment success rate is very contingent to the number of cases you do like anything else, uh, the confidence in the technology and the ability to really push the balloon across well and position the balloon properly to get a good occlusion before you freeze uh, comes in by doing a few cases. And so um, the single procedure success rate was about 60 percent, and about 19 percent of these people ended up having redo procedures. Uh, that ends up with a cumulative success rate of about 70 percent at the end of 12 months for these. There were five people who had experienced uh, complications, including two patients that had pulmonary vein stenosis and uh, one cardiac tamponade, worsening atrial flutter, and so forth. There were no atriesophageal fistula in this particular series, uh, one stroke. Uh, there were a total of seven patients who had pulmonary vein stenosis, um, 
and about 29 of them uh, ended up, which included the drug cryo crossovers, uh, had phrenicnal palsies. And these are the details of the complications, which I think are not relevant to this talk at this point in time. So with that, I will conclude and take any questions if there are any. And I heard that uh, the Indian government just gave the permission to allow this catheter to be commercially available here. Yes, sir. Okay. In the early on, when we did these cases, uh, the first few cases where we reapplied and reapplied, and I was not able to get a good occlusion, then obviously I basically took out an RF catheter and touched up a few things. But as the learning curve gets better, uh, your confidence in the catheter gets better, and then. If you, are able, if you are unable to get a good occlusion in one angle, you can actually prop the catheter up, a pull down technique or a pull up technique um, uh, will enable you to uh, get a good occlusion. So it, the same thing applies even to the, uh, the laser balloon catheters or any other uh, balloon technology. So touch up has become less and less of an issue uh, nowadays than what it used to be at the, at the very beginning. So uh, you can, whenever you don't get a good occlusion in a particular segment, so what you can do is uh, make sure you move your balloon well in that particular sector and then see if you can get a decent contact and then reapply uh, the prior lesion. You should be able to get it isolated. Regarding this free nick now, uh, can, it should be reversible if we recognize it early enough. So is there a way to monitor it like fluoroscopy or something? I mean, we, we bring them in for a, for a fluoroscopy uh, at one month. And no, 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 at the time of applying cryo. If we recognize it early enough, it should be reversible. Or you think it it's a late complication? Yes. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you understand that you're getting phenic nerve stunning, before it becomes paralyzed uh, by coming off and trying it, I mean, most of the cases we have seen it get better by the end of the case. There is uh, some work being done in Europe uh, trying to monitor diaphragmatic myopotentials during uh, ongoing cryo application. And, um, the, there is encouraging data to suggest that a reduction in the amplitude of diaphragmatic myopotentials precedes any detectable reduction in the movement. And therefore, you can actually detect it earlier before there is actually any change in the contractility. So and is that a surface patch that they put yes. on? Yes. Yeah. So, so this, is, this is very encouraging. And uh, I think uh, iterative versions of this, uh, perhaps recording directly from subdiaphragmatic regions, may also provide a higher discrimination, a higher sensitivity to in the reversible phase of cryo injury to the phrenic nerve. Because you have a much uh, bigger area of target, right? With, with RF ablation, it's only a single point of lesion, where here you have a, a 28 millimeter balloon catheter that's creating a, even a much bigger balloon, uh, a crystal. Uh, that has a much bigger area of capture, so that explains the increased frequency of uh, phrenic nerve involvement in this case. What about the durability of cryolysis? Do we have any data on it? Well, at least in the, in the series in the stop AF, uh, of those redos that have the 19% redos they did, they were happy to say that there was only a segmental reconnections in a, in a few areas that they were able to uh, get to. So uh, we don't have as much data as you have on RF ablations, but again, it's, 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 it's very pretty similar to RF in, in a sense. That, but there is no back-to-back -back studies to really give the hardcore information. That's some data from Amber where they were talented to look at the Get, get a good occlusion with the balloon. So oftentimes you may have to uh, do a loop, typical loop around to get the balloon shoved into that. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bilt.